All right, so welcome to Building Engagement with a Synchronous Session. I'm excited to go over hopefully some new ideas to get your students energized about your course. I thought before we started with all of the heavy content, uh, we could take a look at a quote. Maybe this is my English background coming out, but um, we are going to start with defining engagement. Um, and after that, we're going to move into our icebreakers and introductions. I want to get to know each of you. And then I have some specific engagement techniques that are geared specifically towards online students if we're using some sort of a synchronous session. Uh, so we can talk about how to set the tone in your course, things that you can do with cameras, breaks in movement, let's talk about micro lectures, and then of course, some specific activities. And I have examples for each of these. So if you're not sure what to do with your course or you just wanna do something different, I hope we can give you a couple of strategies to walk away with today. All right, so as promised, I found a definition for student engagement, and there are many different definitions out there, but this one particularly stood out to me. So I'll let you read that. So the idea here is that student engagement, it's not just something that happens in a classroom, it's ongoing. It's something that your students take with them and it's deeply connected to their emotions. So it's not just a cognitive function. I thought that was something uh, kind of special. All right, so now I, I get to hear from all of you. So again, I hope you can find the text chat, but let me know your name, what do you teach, and then I'd like you to kind of take a moment and think about your own education. I firmly believe that most of us are invested in education because we had positive experiences as students ourselves. So if you can think of a class where you were actively engaged, what are three words or what are three adjectives that come to mind when you, when you think of that memory? Thanks, Matt, I appreciate you being the brave first person out there. So you teach basic legal research. Ooh, how exciting. And you think of class as being vocal, attentive, and curious. Yes. I like this idea that they're talking. Wonderful. Anyone else wanna, wanna share a, a memory? Thanks, Sarav. So, teach computer science and educational technology. So, you think of interaction. Oh, I like that. Question and answer. Yes. Again, I think going back to maybe being vocal and having a good presentation. Wonderful. Right. Well, if any of you are still typing, you can go ahead and um, I may come back to those in just a moment here. But I think with that in mind, we're going to look at some of those descriptions and see if we can come up with some activities and engagement techniques that will incorporate some of your ideas. I do wanna start off um, briefly just by touching on some of the web conferencing tools that are available at NIU. And so we do have three different licensed products. We have Zoom, Blackboard Collaborate, which is what you're in right now, as well as Microsoft Teams. Um, and so without getting too 
tech heavy in this workshop, I, I do want to point out that while all of these different web conferencing tools have a lot of the same functions, um, there are certain features that are unique to each platform. So if you've only experimented with one of them, you might want to start testing out, you know, maybe some other ones just to see if it suits your teaching style. Um, so I know oftentimes we, we have favorites and I think favorites can just be things that develop out of comfort and familiarity. So I, I do just want to throw that kind of on your radar for you. Joan, thank you so much for adding to this. Okay, so you have behavioral health uh, is your, I'm sorry, that's I think what you teach. And then for your um, different descriptions for an engaging classroom, you have storytelling, physical movement, oh, that's interesting, as well as community, wonderful. Okay. So I do have some different techniques today and I can, of course, elaborate if you have questions about maybe some of these specific uh, platforms that we license, but um, you can always shoot me a follow-up message or email about this as well. Um, but some of the techniques I have today, I can even tell you um, which will work in, in which platform. All right, so our, our first one that we want to talk about today is setting the tone. And I actually really love this picture. Um, and it, even if it is a staged photo, it is kind of funny. Um, to me, it, it looks like maybe the student here who has their feet propped up is either uh, very comfortable or, or borderline bored and falling asleep. Um, and so I think when we think about student engagement, it's a student issue. It, it's not something that's unique to online learning. It can happen in any type of classroom setting. So um, students might be distracted. If you look at the laptops, they're, they're looking at different things. People could be having side conversations or playing on their phones. Um, so this happens really just in about any setting. But with that being said, I think there are things that we can do that are unique to online learners. I often hear online learning compared and contrasted to face-to-face -face learning, and I don't think that one is better than the other. I just think that they're different, and so we're going to look at different strategies, and we're going to look at what works well in an online synchronous setting. So one thing that I want you to consider is that every time you start your course, you have an opportunity to do something different. In an online class, you are actually saving some valuable time because you don't have to take attendance, right? You can just pull an attendance report at the end of class. So you've saved some of this additional time. And I want you to give yourself permission to take that time and use it to engage your students in an activity. The activity may or may not be related to your coursework, but in either case, it's going to serve a valuable function. So if you're looking for a metaphor here, you can think of your class as this rigorous exercise for your students' brains, but we, we want them to stretch first. So as you think about your class, I want you to think about setting yourself a goal. And this starts with looking at how many times you meet. For instance, if you have a 16-week course and maybe you meet synchronously once a week, I um, mean, you can subtract maybe a few holidays in there. You might be looking at around 14 synchronous class sessions. So that's 14 different opportunities for you to start your class with a different activity. So what could that look like? Well, I'm going to give you some suggestions here. You could start your class with a video clip. You could give your students a survey, a quiz, or you could even provide a link to a Kahoot's question in the text chat. You could start your class one day talking about weird news. You could start your class by giving your students a series of trivia questions. Another day, you could engage them in journal activities or reflections or even a free write. You could start your class with current events. Another idea with your students is to think about the five different senses, right? Instead of just thinking of your online class as where your students are sitting in front of their computer, think about other ways that you can engage them, even though you're not physically in the same space. 
So you could email them ahead of time and tell them that you're going to start class with coffee and conversations. And if they're not coffee drinkers, that's okay. Tell them to bring their favorite beverage. If you're getting ready to prepare for your midterms, you could think about fun things like midterms and munchies. Matt says he had a professor who started every class with a student reading a poem they had to write for that class. He would start every class saying poetry slam and turn it over to the student. It was a lot of fun. Excellent. I love that. Um, funny. My next one on my list was have students lead the class. So I, I think we were thinking on the same lines here. Um, another idea here is something that I call silly slogans. This is a fun one to get your students thinking creatively. You can give your students a random product. Uh, it could be anything. It could be something like the Roomba. And you can divide them up into groups. Ask your students to come up with a new product pitch on the condition that they can only use existing product slogans that have already been developed. Um, it's a good exercise. They can think about you know, all of the pop culture, they can think about advertising, um, and, and they can repurpose an existing slogan, um, and, and students can vote amongst themselves on which one they, they like the best. Another idea here is, again, we have online learners. So um, you might want to think about where are they studying um, and ask your students again ahead of time to take a picture of their workstation. This could be their desk. Um, as you may find out, some online learners don't have desks, um, it, but it can be a fun activity. You can even ask them to post it um, in a discussion board or they could send it to you anonymously, um, or well, I should say they should send it to you and you can post them anonymously and you can see if they can identify uh, who belongs to which workstation. Um, but again, it's this idea of community building. It's this idea that people are sharing, they're conversing, um, and they're actually doing something. So um, starting your class every day with a fresh activity might be a goal that you can set. If you're not up to the task of trying something new, there is um, a second option that I think is available to you. When students enter into an online class, typically it's quiet. People come in muted, their microphones are off, and they'll wait for the instructor to start the class. Um, again, you have an opportunity here to build a community um, and to change the space. So you could give them some instructions on what you consider course appropriate material, but ask every single student to supply uh, the list of a song and you can start each class period by selecting one song from this classroom generated playlist. Um, so again, provide some guidance. What is, what is acceptable for an online classroom? What type of songs are you willing to play? Um, but again, it'll be a surprise that the students can enter the class every day to noise, sound. They can hear different types of songs that their peers listen to, um, and they might not know which one you're going to play. So again, just changing the space immediately is, is one way to engage your students. Okay. The next debate here um, comes down to webcams, right? The camera decision. This has been a heated debate for some time now, particularly due to the pandemic. Um, some instructors really just want to see their students' faces. And without diving too far off topic, I do want to point out that this can bring up equity concerns. Um, and this does kind of form a backbone to our, our student, you know, atmosphere, if you will. So this does need to be taken into consideration. You do, I do want to point out that you want to think about things like student access. It requires strong bandwidth for students to turn on their cameras. So um, simply, some students do not have that type of access. Um, others are juggling families who are all relying on that internet speed and connection. So uh, that can be a concern. And you may have other students who simply are using a cell phone or another compact device to log in. So just be aware of those types of issues. I know that there was an article that came out about a student who went home during the pandemic and logged in uh, to the synchronous session from her family's food truck. That was where she was staying. Um, so literally she had no privacy and, and really did not want to turn on her webcam. 
And I know I have actually worked with students who are active military and they are prohibited from displaying their background. So I, I just wanna bring this out here, put it on your radar, bring it to your attention. Um, I tell you this not to discourage you from using webcams, but to think about how you're going to use them and when. So you may also want to be open to experimentation. Remember, I told you we had three different platforms. Um, and so each of them can do some different things. So you might find yourself deciding that I'm only going to turn on cameras for part of the class, or maybe there's a platform that I want to use because of some of the features that it has integrated. For instance, um, in Zoom, you could tell your students ahead of time that you want them to upload a background of their favorite movie screen. So that way, when you turn on uh, your cameras. Um, everybody has a different background, but nobody's personal space is actually being displayed on camera. So that's something to consider. You might decide that um, you could also use, again, this works well with Zoom, but you can use filters or fuzzy backgrounds, um, and you can encourage students to, to maybe um, go a little bit out of their comfort zone, but still give them some privacy that way. Um, I think in Teams, there's something, um, I don't know if any of you have seen this background, so I, I think I have a picture of it for you. Um, there's the Teams together mode. So if you ask your students to turn on their webcams, it physically picks the, um, the person out and it puts them um, in a pretend classroom, like a lecture hall. So that's kind of what you're seeing there. That's that picture. Or I don't think that you necessarily need to think of having webcams on as being able to see whether students are awake or engaged. Um, there are other things that you can do. And so if you want to tell your students to turn off their webcams, um, but you want to have something visual to look at other than blank tile screens um, during your synchronous session, you can ask students to upload pictures for their profiles. Um, and you can set a new category for each class if you want. Um, so, you know, you could have them do their their favorite superheroes or you know, cartoons or their favorite movie character. Um, so this will give you, again, just something visual um, to look at and, and it'll help your students kind of get excited for your class as well. Right, breaks and movement. I know you're, you're ready to hear about all the different activities that you can do in a course. Um, but again, I, I do want you to think about your, your class and your space and the online landscape is a little bit different. I want you to think about if you do have webcams on, uh, how this can, can impact your students. They have a very small range of movement and otherwise all of a sudden they're off screen. So think about what you can do to help make your students more comfortable. Um, you can ask them to get up and move around. So, um, you know, if you notice some kind of glazed over looks uh, in your, your webcams, uh, you might actually ask them to physically get up and move around. A good rule of thumb is that per one hour of class, um, consider giving your students a 10 or 15 minute break. So, you know, let them go get a new drink, get them, get them up, let them have bathroom breaks, uh, let them stretch and move. Um, but all of these things are actually going to help them focus on your course material. So whether you have webcams on or not, it, it still is a good idea to encourage your students to get up, to move around, um, and then to resume class. So. And of course, I, I did have on there the, all, the, all the positive benefits of getting up and moving uh, without being a health expert. Um, but I, I think it can, again, enhance your classroom atmosphere. All right, so I have a question for all of you. And again, um, if you would like to come on the microphone, you can do that. Or if you prefer text chat, you can do that as well. Um, you can answer one or both of these, but in your opinion, how long should a lecture last? Or on average, how long do your classroom lectures last? There is no right or wrong answer. But it's always good to hear different perspectives. So I will leave it up to you.
All right, I see a couple of answers coming in here. So Sarav says 30 minutes and then a break and then another 30 minutes. Great. Joan says perhaps an alternate lecture material for 15 minutes with an exercise to engage in a different way. Matt has, I feel like lecture should be 10 minutes with five minute active breaks in between. Uh, repeat four times for a total of 60 minutes. Great. So all different perspectives on this. Um, and, and I think this is pretty normal. I, I think um, if you were to survey different instructors across campus, I think you would get all sorts of different answers. It can depend on a lot of different factors too. It can depend on how many times you meet per week. Um, so there's all different things that we want to take into consideration. But I would like to introduce the concept of a micro lecture. Now, again, you will find different perspectives out there, but again, if we're just going for general rules of thumb, uh, most people will say that on average, the longest that a student will concentrate and really focus on lecture materials is 20 minutes tops. After that, their attention starts to wander um, and they're going to lose a little bit of focus. So micro lectures, it's this idea that your, your lecture material is around 10 to 15 minutes, maybe even shorter, it depends on, on what you need to cover. So when I talk about micro lectures, sometimes people will get nervous and they said, well, are you telling me that I need to take an hour's worth of lecture material and condense it into 10 or 15 minutes? And the answer is no. Uh, this goes more towards what Matt was suggesting. Right? 10 minutes with a break and then, and then another 10 minutes. Micro lectures though work best if you have some sort of maybe a script or an outline. If you go into it thinking, all right, I'm going to lecture for, well, I was going to lecture for 60 minutes, so um, I'm gonna break it up into four pieces. What happens is the instructor usually will start to look down at the, the clock. They feel like they're being timed and they've gotta get all of it in before their 15 minutes is up and this can lead to rambling and other problems. So to help them, what we usually recommend is creating some sort of an outline. I see we've got the, the burger or the sandwich here, um, but it's this idea that you're going to have your important bullet points already set aside and your concluding sentence. You know, If you could leave your students with one lasting impression, what would it be? So you can start by breaking up your course into micro lectures. And then as far as synchronous class sessions go, you can think about when do I present them? So are there some of these that I could record and they can watch on their own time? If so, that means that you can save maybe some of the more intense lectures, the ones where students typically have the most questions for class. Um, and you can pepper those in there in with their other activities. Um, so think carefully about what are you going to use your valuable synchronous course session time for. I would recommend that you try to incorporate as many activities and student learner um, projects as possible, the ones where there's some sort of active learning going on. Um, we find that lectures typically are more of a passive environment. So if you can try to turn the tables and ask your students to do something during your valuable course time, then you can save your lecture material or a portion or a bulk of your uh, lecture material as an asynchronous activity. All right, so I have another question for you. Now we're gonna actually move into the part where we talk about activities and what students can do during the synchronous session. Um, and so I, I think there are some things that we already know. We know that we have breakout rooms available. Um, so I'd like you to think about this. What do you have your students do in their breakout groups? Or if you're new at teaching, maybe, maybe you've been in a breakout group as a student. What did you do? You were divided up 
and then what? Okay, I see some different answers here. Discuss a question related to their thoughts on the most recent lecture material. Ask them to discuss a topic and present it. Oh, I like that. Turn the tables on them and let's see. Work on an exercise that they covered, um, or I'm sorry, that was covered in the lecture um, and then see how it works in practice. Wonderful. I asked this because I, I think that sometimes we we know about the functionality of breakout groups, but we're we're looking for a little bit of inspiration, something else that we can add. You know, what am I doing already and, and what can I add to that cycle? So One of the things that I, I like to do here, and um, again, I didn't get a, a ton of detail from any of you on this, so this might be something you're already doing, but is the idea that once I put you into a breakout group, not only do I want you to talk about something, um, I actually want you to work on a task. And so I like to give worksheets to my students. And if you're wondering how to do this effectively, one of the things that you can do is you can go to the NIU website. Um, at the top of the screen there, there's a tab that says Quick Links, and you can click on Office 365. That'll give you the, the little square of dots. You can see my red arrow is pointing to it, and um, you can save something to the OneDrive. I like the OneDrive. It's a cloud-based uh, server you can save your documents here. So sometimes you need to think about this a little bit in advance. Um, try to think about how many groups you might divide your students into potentially. If you have seven groups, you might create a worksheet and you're gonna save it seven different times and you're gonna call it group one, group two, group three, you know, and so on. When you put your students into the breakout groups, tell them to find their corresponding worksheet. Um, and so the nice part here is this idea that you've created shared documents for your students. They can um, click on the, the link that you've provided and, and they can start filling it out. So it adds another element to just beyond putting them into a breakout group and having them discuss something. Now they actually have something tangible to work with. And I think I put the um, process here. So again, the first step was just to create that worksheet. Your second step is once you're in your synchronous course, go ahead and post the links to the documents in the main breakout chat. You're gonna wanna do this before you put them in breakout groups. Um, then you can divide students into their corresponding uh, breakout groups, and then you can get creative with the instructions. And so one of the ideas here is that sometimes you'll notice that students in any class, um, you're going to have some who are very vocal and you're going to have some who are very reserved. And so you can go ahead here and, and you can mix it up. You can start telling students that um, once you're in your group, whoever has the smallest shoe size is going to be the person who um, records your answers on the worksheet. And whoever has the largest shoe size is responsible for presenting on your, on your answers when we come back together as a main group. So you can get as creative as you like with these instructions, but the idea here is every time you divide your students into groups, you can help them kind of talk, converse, um, give them a little bit of an icebreaker, but also assign them specific tasks so that everybody is actively involved in this uh, great breakout group activity. I've seen all sorts of things. You can ask them whoever currently is furthest away from campus is in charge of 
this task. Um, so again, you're, you're getting them all involved. Um, you're not waiting for volunteers. And it's this idea that when your students come to your class, whether webcams are on or off, everybody has to participate. So again, some other activities that we can think about. Um, again, here, I, I know you're laughing at my little cartoon here, but it's this idea that the students are driving their own education. And so you want to think about active learning techniques, um, and you want to think about ways that you can engage all of their different senses. So what are some things that you can do to um, get them excited and, and really motivated in your course? It can be as simple as bringing in other speakers. For them, it might be nice for them to hear other voices. So you can bring in subject matter experts. You could also bring in a librarian. Um, every college has kind of its own subject matter librarian expert. So they can come in and really help your students learn how to navigate the um, library. They can really focus it just on your subject matter. So that's something that you can do. Um, it's not always going to be you presenting in class. You can also think about doing Shark Tank exercises. So this is where you bring in a little bit of a sense of competition amongst your students. Maybe not like somebody's going to get first, second, or third place, or you know, if you win, you get more points than your peers. Uh, but again, it's a healthy sense of competition. You can give everybody a task. Uh, the groups are going to compete. And then you're going to have a external panel come in and review each of the different entries. Another idea is, again, the scavenger hunt. Scavenger hunts can take on the form of an academic scavenger hunt. Instead of you having to lecture them about material, um, this is a great way for them to, to go back and to prove that they've reviewed all of your different content, whether this is something that you embedded in a recorded lecture, if it was something they were supposed to have read in their textbook, um, or if you want to tell them to go out and research something um, and see what they can bring back. You can also create a virtual escape room as a way for students to prepare for an exam. So instead of just printing out maybe a study guide, um, you could still provide that, but on the in the class period before your large exam, you can have students go through a virtual escape room where they test their knowledge. And again, this is another uh, wonderful group activity. I do believe I'm working on creating a workshop dedicated just to showing you how that works. But um, in the meantime, you can go and just do a Google search. You can go on YouTube. And there's all different examples where people show you step by step how to create one of these. You can also ask your students, of course, to give presentations. So this is, again, the flipped classroom environment where they are going to teach the class. So you can give them specific topics. Um, and each group or each student will make sure to present on their individual piece. You can come up with an idea for circulation. So this is the, the point where it's like speed networking. Ask your students to come prepared with a list of questions. Instead of you answering the questions, you're going to divide your students into breakout groups. Students will work amongst their group to see if they can answer each other's questions. And then you can change the, the breakout groups and move them to a new group. So they're going to have opportunities to interact with students who have all different questions, um, and they might get all different advice. So it's a great way to see if they can, as a community, um, build up their knowledge bank. And finally, um, you can ask your students to pick a project um, which is based on self-enrollment. So a lot of these web conferencing tools have a self-enroll feature. Instead of you dividing students up into groups, you can post groups um, that are divided up by topic, right, by category. And students are going to self-enroll. They're going to pick their project based on their own individual interests. So um, again, giving some of that autonomy back to the students that they are in charge of their education and that they can self-direct a bit. So you can provide guidance, but ultimately they can make some of their own decisions. I know we're 
moving pretty quick here, so I do apologize for that, but um, we are getting down to, to the end here, and I wanted to see if any of you have any questions or suggestions. And if you have any questions about your own individual course, uh, we can maybe come up with some suggestions for you as a group. I will go ahead and I'll turn off the recording in case you didn't want to share.